In the book of Leviticus comes a term that we have used many times in conversation, in theological conversation, in preaching moments, in justice moments, the word jubilee. The reason I titled this message today, a divine reset, is because jubilee from the hand of God to the children of Israel was given by God to Moses on Mount Sinai. And God suggested two things to, Mo to Moses. One was what I call a short-term jubilee and the other a long-term jubilee. And just to move quickly toward definition and application, Jubilee was often used as a time to let the land rest and to let the people rest. Came periodically after six years of the fields yielding fruit. In the seventh, they rested. It was a very logical agricultural move because the land needed an opportunity for the rains to come, for some of the floods to come to bring the deposits to the land that would encourage the soil to bear forth fruit. But there was another Jubilee, the one that was seven weeks of years, it was called the 50th year, after the 49th year, the 50th year, which was a Jubilee that was designed by God for the children of Israel to have a full stop, a complete reset. Time to restore one another, time to restore families, time to eliminate debt, time to forgive, time to reset. And I wanna begin in my conversation today, in my sharing today, that that's what I believe we are in right now. I believe that circumstances are suggesting, in fact, are making it clear that it's time for a full stop. Let me be more specific. It is time to stop trying to make things work that are broken at the core. When I was a little girl coming up in the Pentecostal church, the old folks used to sing a song that said, stop, turn around, look and see how you've been living in the world. And you know, in black Pentecostalism, we sing the same line over and over and over and over until you get it. And that was what the song said, stop, turn around, look and see how you've been living in the world. Stop, turn around, look and see how you've been living in the world. And then sometimes the application would be what you've been doing, where you've been going, how you've been living in the world. I think that this country and countries all over our living planet have been given a divine opportunity to stop, turn around, look and see. How have we been living in the world? And I contend that we need a spirit of jubilee. In fact, I wanna go a little further and say, I believe that the spirit of God is sending to us a spirit, a wind of jubilee. Why do we need it? Well, let's talk about wealth for just a moment. The sickness of wealth and entitlement is epidemic in our world. The unrest in our cities, not just across the US, but across the world has made the world almost seem very small because we are all in this together. And this demonstration of pushing back against the sickness of wealth and entitlement and the sickness of abuse Black Lives Matter this week is not only about the murder of George Floyd. It is about the justice divide between black folks and white folks. 
And in this country, black and white citizens, the latest manifestation and struggle will continue until access to the wealth gap between white people and black people is addressed. And what is the greatest wealth gap in our nation? It is the stark divide between how much capital white people and black people control. There is a stark divide. By one estimate, the typical white family has wealth of $171,000. That's an average. This is nearly 10 times greater than the $17,150 average for black families. And let me put that another way. The typical black household remains poorer than 80% of white households. And the stunning wealth gap between the races has persisted in good times and bad over the past 70 years. It did not get better after the civil rights era legislation in the 60s or even during the Obama administration. And this is the underlying fuel for unrest in our nation. Black economists continue to say that a principal historical cause for this wage gap was and is indentured slavery. The gap has its roots in the labor of one class for the benefit of another class. And Jim Crow laws put in place shortly after the Civil War also kept black people impoverished on purpose. A more recent and complex cause was the systemic exclusion of black people from the US housing market beginning in 1920. Housing is one of the main engines of accumulating wealth in America. Restrictive laws were put on houses that limited where black people could live. And these laws, these covenants combined with discriminatory credit policies kept black people from building wealth. At the same time, government policies were put in place to assist whites to build wealth through housing. For instance, in Minneapolis, where the current protests began after the death of George Floyd while being detained by police, white Americans first benefited from the Homestead Act. Some of you know about it because your parents and grandparents were living during that time when white soldiers were coming from World War II they were giving low cost, cheap loans to buy homes in the suburbs. But these neighborhoods and this opportunity was off limits to black people. And the only props, excuse me, and the only prosperous black community in the city, in the city was burned to the ground to build a highway from Minneapolis to St. Paul. This happened to other black communities on the rise. You know something about the Greenville massacre. Wherever black communities seemed to push beyond and become prosperous, they were victimized often by the Ku Klux Klan. This nation needs to stop blaming a whole race of people for not acquiring what was not, and in many cases, still is not accessible. Let's be clear, let's be honest before God. Banks don't lend equally. This nation could fix this by setting aside funds for the express purpose of making loans and education and healthcare specifically available to communities that have contributed to the wealth of this young nation. And the nation cannot blame people who do not have what was stolen from them. The United States of America is indebted to African-Americans, no matter how angry our leaders in the White House get by hearing this. Equal wealth jubilee, this is holy work. How about our planet? She needs to rest. We need a more earth-friendly existence. 
And just one element of that, our seas, our oceans are filled with plastics that will never go away. And the numbers are staggering. There are 5.25 trillion pieces of plastic debris in the ocean. Of that mass, 269,000 tons float on the surface of the ocean. Four billion plastic microfibers per square kilometer litter the deep ocean. Plastic killing sea animals who are eaten by other sea animals that are harvested and fished by humans who are eating plastic through sea animals and who are diseased and are living with cancer as a result. We must reduce our footprint or we won't have a footprint. What we do or don't do, our grandchildren will pay for. I'll say it again, what we do or what we don't do, our grandchildren will pay for it. And our mother earth is tired. Earth rest jubilee. This is holy work. And let's talk about religion. There are some religious beliefs that almost all of humankind adopted. One in particular that has always intrigued me is God bless you when somebody sneezes. Have you noticed that? When somebody sneezes, usually someone around, whether they believe in God or not, will say, God bless you. When you cough or blow your nose, nobody blesses you. But there's something about speaking life and healing and good fortune over a sneeze that has been part of human belief universally for millennia. When you sneezed, the Romans would say salve or good health to you. When you sneezed, the Greeks would say long life to you. Pope Gregory the Great would say God bless you because a sneeze was attributable to certain forms of the plague. The Germans would say Gesundheit or health to you for the same reason. The Arab countries with Muslim influence would say Alam du li Allah or praise be to God, you lived. <laughs> the Hindu word that means live well would be given when you sneeze. In Russia, they would say Rosti Bolshoi or grow strong and live long, or grow strong and grow up. And in some Chinese dialects, the response is interpreted, may you live 100 years. If humankind can come up with universal words for healing a sneeze across time, language, belief systems, age, race, gender, sexuality, and governments, Surely, people who say that we know the divine can come up with words to articulate the divine of our understanding without needing to harm one another. Surely, we can find healing intersections in our holy writ. Surely, we can see God and good beyond the frailty of our languages, our customs, our interpretations, our race, our time-honored beliefs, and our practices. Surely, our common teachings on love and doing no harm should at least have as much power as Gesundheit. To do this, there are some things we need to fix about religion. I would venture to say that our inability and unwillingness to fix what religion now defends in many places is what is part and parcel to what is happening in our world right now. In particular, we need to fix the what I call thugs for God stories or stories that suggest that God is thuggish and on the sides of thugs. 
When David killed Uriah and took Bathsheba, that was thuggish. We can't make it anything else. It was thuggish. He was the king, but it was thuggish. Yet he is known not only as a king, but as a king after God's own heart. Because we look beyond his thuggishness. I'm not suggesting he wasn't a great man, that he didn't do great things, but that does not fix the reality that he did something that was thuggish. When Saul was on his way to Damascus to destroy the people of the way, he was a certified religious thug, carrying out orders from the Sanhedrin. And the conquest and reconquest of Byzantium and Constantinople and Istanbul, by the way, those are three different names of the same city, depending on which religious thug was in charge. And in a series of some of the history's bloodiest wars, all of these leaders fought in the name of God and religion while blood ran in the streets. Each conqueror and his crusaders believed themselves and their brand of religion to be the will of God, no matter how thuggish they were. As long as they wore the symbol of their faith, that was all that mattered. Just wear the cross or just wear the scepter or just hold up a Bible for a photo op and stand next to the statue of a Pope or quote from two Corinthians. You can make yourself a God approved thug and your self-righteousness and your self-righteous army becomes a holy army because you are God's thug. Who are the religious people who will empower a thug? Who are the people who name the name of God and will empower someone who mistreats, demeans, and demoralizes the people of God? Who will destroy a race to lift up another? Who are the religious people who will empower a thug? Those who benefit from the thug's power and thinks that God winks at evil just for their benefit. This is how religion sanctifies a thug. Received ways to get into God's favor come in many forms and they buy pardons for thugs. Perceived ways to get into God's favor come in many forms and buy pardons for thugs. A religious thug can do things like enact religious freedom laws and church people will love them. A religious thug can diminish and abuse women and church people will love them. A religious thug can demonize and disempower LGBT people and their families. And there are church people that will just love them. A religious thug can vilify immigrants, prioritize the wealthy at the expense of the poor, disregard the health of the planet, and religious people will still love them. And they'll say, say what you want to about him. Say what you want to about her. That's God's thug and my thug. But I want you to hear me today. A thug is a thug. In fact, the culture of religion can be mistaken as the kingdom of God when the practices that have been made holy by that culture do not honor God. Having many followers and money appears to be symbols of God's approval. The greatest current confusion right now is how is it that a great nation 
and a great national religion cannot command God to get these people out of the street, cannot command God to get COVID-19 under control, cannot command God to kill the gays, cannot con command God to force other nations to respect our power, cannot command God to make the mayor of Washington, D.C. take Black Lives Matter out from in front of the White House. And I declare to you today, today is thuggish religion jubilee. And this is holy work. Finally, my beloved, we cannot bring long-term equality and systemic change to people if we do not believe that all people deserve to thrive. All people. All people deserve to thrive pre-existing conditions, which is by the way, a code name for black and brown people at fault for their own illness and their own issue. It does not take inequality under consideration. Disproportionate realities and opportunities for African-Americans before COVID-19 make African-Americans vulnerable to COVID-19. There is no shelter in place without a shelter. Lack of access to rest time and healthy food, lack of insurance for preventative treatment, inadequate income, receiving primary care in emergency rooms creates pre existing conditions. Neighborhoods with mold, leaching toxins from dumps, and drinking lead water like the children in Flint still do, creates pre-existing conditions. We need a blaming the victim jubilee. And this is holy work. I wanna thank you young people. I wanna thank young adults in particular of every hue and every background for standing up for the George Floyds of our present and our past. This is not the first march, but I declare every round goes higher and higher. Thank you for staying the course to move the conversation to the holy work of demanding a jubilee reset for this nation. We need rest and we need justice. We need rest and we need justice. We need a full stop. We need a full stop and we need a full reset until justice runs down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream.